Hi, I'm Kim, mental health worker with Clarence Jaycock School. With our time in the schools winding down, the mental health team and I wanted to make a video talking about some of the mental health issues you may experience within your classroom. Today, I'm going to be speaking about depression. So first off, the good old question, what is depression? Depression is a mood disorder that causes persistent feelings of sadness or loss of interest. So if a child in your classroom who is usually outgoing starts to um, not be so outgoing, maybe just sit at their desk, sit out there at their desk with their head down, this may be a sign that they are starting to get a little bit depressed. Um, if they are usually the first one in line for lunch and now they're not eating lunch at all, this could be also a warning sign of depression. So what are some of the signs someone may be depressed? Some of the signs may be they have physical complaints about stomach or headaches, have more angry or cranky outbursts, they're always looking sad, feeling sad. If you ask them how they are, they're going to say they're sad. Or they might talk about feeling hopeless. Um, they may be more sensitive. So if usually the children in the class can joke around with one another, maybe this it's a little bit more touchy for this, this student and they come and complain about it more to you. You might find that they are missing school because they're sleeping at home more. Um, so their attendance might drop or they may sleep in class more. So a student that never slept in class may just put their head on the desk and fall asleep for a few hours. Um, and there might be even outbursts of crying. <clears throat> and with those outbursts of crying, you might hear, I'm not worth it, nobody likes me. Those are some of the signs that um, a student in your classroom might be depressed. If you do see those signs, I would encourage you to contact their family um, somebody, the caregiver, and let them know what's going on, what are some of the signs that you see within your classroom, and hopefully that they can get some help. So some of the treatment options would be help them find something fun. So within your classroom, if you've seen that they really, really, really like to draw or paint, maybe one day you would just say, okay, today we're gonna draw and paint and see if you can get them awake and doing that kind of activity. If they're still not um, going to do that activity, a little gentle encouragement. And then if that's still a no, they might need to look for other options such as um, uh, attend, attending therapy or uh, maybe even needing to go on medication. One of the best things that you can do to help somebody with depression is celebrate the small successes. So let's say um, they have come in, in the last three days they've been sleeping at their desk and today they haven't slept at all at their desk. Celebrate that, acknowledge it, let them know that you, you've noticed. Um, maybe their attendance has been low and they came two days in a row. Once again, celebrate that. Let them know, you know, right on, I'm so glad you're here, I'm, I miss you when you're not here. Please continue to come. Those little words of encouragement throughout the day are gonna help try to bring that student up and that student's gonna know that somebody cares about them and that they are important. Hello, my name is Damien Abrahams. I'm the mental health therapist at Cadot Lake School and we are doing videos on um, some of the mental health issues that arise on reserve. And today I will be talking to you about suicide. And we all know that is a big problem on a lot of uh, Indigenous reserves. And the, the really important part is to take every declaration of suicide seriously. Even if you think that um, they're just joking, you need to treat it seriously and you need to address it up front. One of the, the there, there's a checklist that um, you need to go down in order to determine the severity of their declaration. Um, you need to find out if they have um, if they have the means to complete their plan. You need to find out if they do have a plan in the first place and if they have the means to do it. And what I mean by the means to do it is if they have access to weapons, if they have access to um, dangerous medications, what their plan might be and on how to execute that. 
If a suicide threat seems real and they have a specific plan and the means to carry out that plan, it is okay to call 911. It is okay to reach out and, and bring in mental health professionals to help you deal with the situation. Oftentimes, if they've expressed that to you, that means that they trust you to be with them. Another strategy is, is to, to stay with that person through the whole crisis and to meet them on their level um, and not to argue with them. Um, and definitely don't challenge them. For example, um, don't declare that they don't seem like the person to commit suicide. If they approach you saying that they're going to commit suicide, that's the best time to intervene because when they announce that to someone, they're reaching out for help. They're in the pre-contemplation phase and, and they're not actually going to do it right now and they're just reaching out for help because a person who is beyond that, that stage of suicide ideation, they're not going to announce it, they're just going to do it. So when you're talking with your students in this phase, it, it is important to talk with them as openly as possible and to use the word suicide and use the words kill themselves um, because in their mind they might not be thinking about that they just want to be they're just looking for ways to end the pain one of the other tips that i have is to remove their means to actually carry out their plan um, that means removing knives scissors anything sharp medications or anything else that you think that they would be able to hurt themselves with it is very hard to know if a person is going to commit suicide or not but there are some warning signs that you can look for certainly if they've made an attempt before or if they have had previous suicide ideation or if they've had someone in their family who has committed suicide or has talked about it. Any mental health problems such as severe depression and if there's been family violence in the home, um, physical abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, any of those things, if those are present in the home, those are uh, leading indicators of suicide. Drug and alcohol abuse in the home is also a factor. Um, events that put people at greater risk of suicide are life-changing events such as a death of someone in their family, death of a friend, one of their best friends decided not to be their best friend anymore, uh, breakups, things like that. A diagnosis of uh, physical illness such as HIV or cancer, a loss of independence or being able to get around without help, living alone or not having contact with any friends. Some other warning signs are if they plan to say or they want to hurt themselves or kill themselves or someone else. Um, they talk, write, read or draw about deaths including writing suicide notes or talking about items that can cause physical harm such as pills, guns or knives or razor blades. They say that they have no hope, they feel trapped, and there's no point in going on. They tend to drink more alcohol or use more drugs, including prescription medications. They no longer want to see the people that bring them joy. They no longer want to take care of themselves or follow medical advice or give away their things. One of the intervention strategies that I've made in the past is I go through that checklist. If they have the means to, take, to carry out a plan, if they have a plan and they're just waiting and one of the strategies that I've met that with is to go through a safety plan with them and have them as well as myself sign it. And those are just some of the strategies and some of the ways that I have intervened with suicide ideation. Hello everyone, my name is Sonia Kandilwal and I am a registered professional psychologist. I want to talk about bullying. So just letting you know what bullying exactly is. So it includes like different components such as like bullying is aggressive behavior um, that students, they, they throw sometimes uh, in the classrooms. I will show you this image here. And that this bullying involves like unwanted negative actions as well. Bullying involves a pattern of behavior like repeating things again and again commenting on the same thing same person over and over again is a kind of bullying and bullying also invo involves an imbalance of power or uh, strengths to another person let's move ahead and talk about uh, what kinds of bullies are so bully is like um, it could be physical bullying uh, or maybe social verbal or cyber 
So if we talk about like physical bullying, as you see in this picture, it can be like stealing or hitting anyone, pulling hair, or breaking someone's uh, favorite thing, pushing, pulling, tripping, those kind of things come as um, in physical bullying. But if we talk about social bullying, it comes like telling other kids not to be friend with someone else and not telling the reason behind that or excluding other, you, you will not be in our team, that kind of stuff. Or spreading rumors like, you know, that is cheap, that is expensive, those kind of things. Um, or commenting about anybody's body shape or something like that. So that comes in social bullying. If we talk about verbal bullying, is verbal is like uh, threatening anyone or giving a hurtful comments or teasing, naming by calling their names or calling their names in a different way. So that is a verbal bullying. Cyberbullying is uh, like texting on the internet, pranking or pranking in by calling other on phone, rude comments on Facebook, Instagram, and the mean texting, that kind of stuff comes in in cyberbullying. So what we should do, we have to stop bullying in school as well as anywhere in the society. So there are some of the warning signs that I would like to share with you. So if uh, you find any unexplainable injuries um, in any of the student, then there could be something uh, behind that. If their grades are getting downwards, then and, and if the kids, they don't want to show up in the school, then then you need to figure out like something is going on. If there is difficulty in sleeping, if they are uh, having nightmares again and um, they're not uh, coming to school and not disclosing their things, then we need to think about like something is going on. If they're changing their eating habits, if they say like uh, um, they have a stomach ache or they are feeling sick or making excuses of feeling sickness, those kind of stuff. Avoiding um, any celebration like social situation that I don't want to go there or feeling ashamed or shame like that. Feeling helpless and their um, self-esteem is decreased. In that way, these are the warning signs that we have to look into. So now, what we can do if these warning signs occurs in the classroom, if there is a celebration in the, in the gym and they say, oh, my stomach is paining and I don't want to go. And if it is repeating again and again, then, then we have to look into that. So there are 10 ways of preventing bullying at school. So um, recognize that bullying impacts your student. Yes, of course. Talk to the student what's going on. You can make a plan, like create an action plan sitting beside the student. Um, the most important thing is that training the staff member and uh, teach students how to be upstander because uh, um, Students need to um, gain the self-confidence and they need to stand on, on the things uh, that they are uh, getting bullied on. Develop a clear system for report, reporting and uh, investigating bullying. You can also involve parents and communities if you wish uh, uh, to involve. And I think uh, appreciation and celebration um, is really important and students should participate in all those activities. I hope uh, you like this video and if you have any question, you can um, email us uh, at uh, sonia.kandelwal at ktcea.ca or uh, if you have any question, you just connect to the school counselor. That will be really appreciating. Wish you all the very best and Merry Christmas. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye. 
Hi everyone, so I'm Sally Jones. I'm the mental health worker with Elizabeth Quintel School. Um, so one of the mental health issues that I wanna talk about today um, that you may notice in some of your students or just have been something to be aware of with some of your students is something called self-injurious behavior. You may also know it as SIBIN. So sometimes um, kids will refer to it as SIBIN. So basically, what self-injurious behavior is, it's the physical action of someone hurting themselves without the intent of dying. And it's usually a way of dealing with difficult emotions and shows a lack of healthy coping mechanisms. Um, so basically what kids have said about sibbing like in recent studies or when they've talked to therapists is that sometimes they just have such an overwhelming amount of emotions and they don't know where to put those or they don't know how to talk about it or express themselves and sometimes what they'll do is they'll do cutting behaviors or self-injurious behaviors as a way of releasing all of those emotions um, so that's kind of one thing that kids have explained about it another thing kids have said about it is that sometimes they just have kind of train themselves to just completely numb out all of their feelings and they would actually engage in self-injurious behaviors just to feel something. So there's a different, a couple different reasons why kids may engage in that. Um, so the other thing is, what are some signs of self-injurious behavior? So some signs of it may be cuts, burns, bruises, on their arms, legs, and stomach areas. Um, so you may notice a lot of times, one of the most common places is kind of in the, these areas here with the wrists. So you may notice kind of some superficial cutting. Um, and sometimes they're like, it may heal very well, but you'll still kind of notice like there'll be a lot of it. So um, other things they can do, you may notice like burns on their body or kind of little things like that. So anything that really um, kind of, I guess, damages their skin is a big thing with self-injurious behavior. So you may also notice too that they wear a lot of bandages. Um, sometimes they may wear wristbands, like they're really thick wristbands. So you may also notice that a, um, a lot as well. Long sleeve shirts, even if it's a really, really hot day, you may also notice that they will wear long sleeve shirts as well. And they may also um, not want to participate in things like swimming activities anywhere where they show certain parts of their body. So they may kind of stay away from certain activities as well. Um, they may also start withdrawing from friends and from family. That could be actually another big sign. Um, and they may also engage in a lot of negative self-talk or self-loathing comments. So these are just a few things just to be aware of. So the next thing is, what are some strategies? So here are some strategies that may work with kids. Elastic bands, sometimes having a child wear an elastic band on their wrist and when they kind of are feeling all these emotions or need to feel something, they can just kind of pop the elastic and a lot of times that can really help them um, to start not cutting as much and hopefully the hope is that they'll just kind of stop the behavior. So that's one thing. Uh, connecting them to a mental health therapist or a professional or somebody who's trained with different therapeutic activities is also another way to really help kids cope with their self-injurious behaviors. Um, listening without judgment is also a big one. Um, and don't try to take this coping skill away from them. So I know that it's not a healthy coping skill for them to have, but it's their help, their coping skill. So it's really important that when we're helping a kid um, to try to stop self-injurious behaviors, that there is a, a mental health professional or a therapist involved so that they can help them kind of um, transition to healthier uh, coping skills. So that's just a really important one to note. Um, and in some cases, Cutting may be a sign of high, high anxiety. So medication may also be something else that may have to be looked at and may help the 
the self-injurious behaviors. So these are just a few things just to be aware of within the school setting. Um, so hopefully, you know, if you ever come across this um, mental health issue, then hopefully these will help you out. So, all right, well, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.